remember when. You probably don't remember what happened 502 years ago the night before, because none of us were around. But 502 years ago on October 31, uh, Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis on the door of the church at Wittenberg. And the reason for doing that is because the next day, on All Saints Day, John Tetzel was going to sell some indulgences. So you can indulge yourself in sin and come and buy some uh, forgiveness, I guess you could call it. It doesn't sound very heartfelt. But what he posted created an earthquake, a spiritual earthquake in Western Europe that eventually went around the world. And the spiritual the spiritual landscape of Western Europe would never be the same. Unfortunately, it seems like we've come full circle, that we may be as bad off now as we were during the French Revolution, uh, before Martin Luther uh, came on the scene. 264 years ago yesterday, there was another event on All Saints Day. Uh, if you've been reading the signs of the times, I don't mean by that the magazine, but what signs should precede the soon coming of Christ, you'll recognize that the Lisbon earthquake fulfilled that prediction from the scriptures. It was an experience never to be forgotten. The earthquake, along with the resulting 10 to 60 foot tsunami that spread east and west and north, amazingly affected places that were a long ways away, not only North Africa, but uh, Scandinavia, Finland, uh, England, Ireland, and uh, some of you may have been reading and found out that even on the east coast of the United States, those tsunamis were felt. And surprisingly, I was not aware of it, but apparently according to some correspondence that was recaptured, they reflected on the fact that it had impacted Brazil as well. And so this, along with two other signs, the, uh, the dark day of May, May 19 uh, and 20, uh, the darkening of the sun um, that day, and then uh, 43 years later, the um, falling of the stars, awakened a slumbering world to the soon coming of Christ. People who were plugged into the scriptures realized that these were signs and began to study the scriptures. And the book of Daniel and Revelation became the focal point. And as you know that our church was um, born in those circumstances. The deist Voltaire reacted as anyone any thinking person with any feelings would with passionate horror over the loss caused by the Lisbon earthquake. Since it was All Saints Day, there were thousands of people in church. There were 200,000 people approximately that lived in Lisbon. And um, this man uh, couldn't understand. He couldn't come to terms with the idea that there was a loving God and that these kind of things ripped people away. They were in church and they perished. How could those things be? His, uh, his frame of reference was that is either God is not good or he is not almighty. Either he wants to stop suffering and cannot, or he could but will not. And Voltaire's question led him to ask the question, how can we worship him as God? And that is the question that grips many people whose world has been turned upside down by their own personal tragedies. About 40 years ago, an equally bewildering 23-year experience threw a believer into panic. Her earthquake was much more personal, but just as devastating as anybody in Lisbon. She had four sons. She and her husband, Frank, had four sons. Two of them were born with abnormalities. The second one, his name was Paul. He had Holler's syndrome, which I had never heard of before. Um, it's marked by dwarfism, unique facial features. Um, there's an arrested development that they don't develop any, anything beyond three years of age. 
Their vision becomes more difficult because of a clouded cornea and the degeneration of the retina. And usually they don't live until they're 12 years of age. Ten years after he was born, her third son was born and he had Down syndrome. Well, knowing this, Mary Craig and her husband Frank kept Paul in their home, but they were faced by painful expressions of people who just were so thoughtless. It's difficult to understand how people can be so cruel. In one situation, Paul was degraded once by a woman on a bus who said, children like this shouldn't be allowed on public transportation. It's not right. In another situation, a man who should have known better, he was a physician and a family friend, he, um, I don't know what tone of voice he said it, said it in, but it must not have been very kind. Children like this shouldn't be allowed, uh, pardon me, um, an animal. That's what he is, an animal. Why don't you have him put away? It's incomprehensible how people can say such cruel things. In addition, there were the humiliating visits to the physicians who wanted to poke and prod and see this unusual experience. And they had to send a school doctor to certify that Paul was uneducatable. And when the doctor arrived, bursting with excitement, she announced with breathless fervor and more demeaning speech, I can't wait to see this child. You think he might possibly be a Cretan? Well, I'm sure you haven't looked it up in the dictionary recently, but I found the Merriam-Webster um, uh, dictionary had 50 synonyms for that. I'm not going to go over them, but all of them were insulting. It is no wonder that Mary almost broke under the strain. One evening she found herself in church uh, praying, if you call it that. Her prayer was filled with toxic hatred and angry anger. She cried out, you don't exist, but I hate you. Then she said, if you do exist, show me a way out. In recounting this experience, she wrote, after this unbridled exhibition, I was startled by the noise I was making and ran out of the church at top speed. Well, she went on to describe how God answered her prayer. And it's amazing how God does answer our prayer when we feel at the bottom of our pit. She found that her way out was through an advertisement for helpers at a home for concentration camp survivors who had immigrated to England. Another campus was on Poland where people immigrated from various parts of Europe. But it was among these who had been starved, beaten, and tortured, and experimented upon that I found faith, she says. In the final chapter of her book, which is actually the title of the book, that chapter's title and the book's title is Blessings, just B-L-E-S-S-I-N-G-S. She meditates on the meaning of suffering, and it is here that she introduces the word redemptive in conjunction with the word suffering. She writes, in the teeth of the evidence, she writes, I do not believe that any suffering is ultimately absurd or pointless, although it is often difficult to go on convincing oneself of this. At first, she wrote, we act, react with incredulity, anger, and despair. It is in sorrow that we discover the things which really matter, and in sorrow we discover ourselves. So what made the difference for Mary reacting one way and Voltaire reacting the other? Some Christians use the term redemptive suffering simply to indicate that affliction although it embitters some, transforms others. Mary Craig writes of the redemptive power of suffering in this sense. Certainly there isn't anything we can do redemptively to persuade God that we're salvageable. Like if we just grit our teeth and bear it, if we just try harder, if we just focus on overcoming these human foibles, God will redeem us, but we don't have to convince him. He needs to convince us that his heart is there for us, that he accepts us before we accept him. We already know, if we've read the Bible, 
and followed Martin Luther's key to the gospel that we don't earn his favor, that redemption is something that God has provided without our asking. It's done for us before we were interested. This extravagant redemption price has been paid for us to give us the assurance of salvation and deliver us from guilt. And we recognize how helpless our propensities are to continue to cave into sin and receive the embrace of Jesus on the cross, that we are accepted as we are. The thief on the cross discovered that. He had no time to go and make things right. Uh, his suffering was interrupted by Jesus' compassion. Jesus was there responding to people who abused him with grace, asking for forgiveness for them. And this thief on the cross, we've been reading in Desire of Ages about his previous interaction with Jesus. He had heard him preach. He had observed him, but he stifled his convictions and went on a crime spree, I guess you would say. But it was, it was not without hope. So when we come to the situations where we find ourselves or others who are our loved ones, we might give up hope. But one could easily have done that back there on that, uh, at that event. They could have given up hope. Maybe this guy's parents, or these two guys' parents were there. And uh, they may have wondered, it's hopeless. But it's never hopeless as long as God gives us life. And our assurance of salvation is as unmistakable as was that of this thief when he was told on the worst day of his life, today I give you this assurance when nothing could be worse that you will be with me in paradise. And uh, fortunately, he was able to um, be impacted by Jesus' compassion and his assurance was given that you will be with me in paradise. Well, in John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, the gospel writer captures Jesus' own words where Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. Well, five verses earlier, Jesus describes his own feelings regarding the, his imminent suffering. Now is my heart troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. So the cross wasn't just an incidental event and the path to wherever Jesus was going. It was his mission statement. It was a distillation of his mission statement that he was substituting himself for the salvation that each of us need. The Apostle Paul weighed in on the importance of the cross several times, and here is one of them, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, where he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then Sister White joins them by making the following statement in 1899. The cross of Calvary is the great center. She was, Adv she was an Adventist. She didn't say the second coming is a great center. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. She didn't say the Sabbath was a great center. She said the cross of Christ is the great center. So we probably need to remind ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists that we need to put the emphasis on the right syllable, which is the cross is the great center. Well, based on these thoughts, it's no plunge of logic to make the following deduction. The cross of Christ is the centerpiece to dealing with the pain in our lives. Can we extrapolate the cross to that ev those kind of events in our life? Not only is it the assurance of our acceptance and justification, it is our motivation and inspiration to remain connected even though the enemy attacks us in such vulnerable places as we are so prone to experience. The cross of Christ is the proof of God's loving solidarity in our pain. The real sting of suffering is not misfortune, nor even the pain of it or the injustice of it, but the apparent God-forsakenness of it. Pain is endurable, 
but the seeming indifference of God is not. And so the cross demonstrates God's heart is the opposite of indifference. It was the costly suffering that he endured, not just Jesus, but the Father endured this price that was paid as well. You can't imagine, can you, that a parent would enjoy the suffering of his child. I mean, that's absurd. And so the Father didn't enjoy the suffering of Jesus. In my mind, I can't help but think that maybe they had this conversation between the Father and Jesus. You know, the Father speaking to Jesus, I would really much rather experience what you're going to experience than to experience what I'm going to experience. Because I can't stand to see you suffer. But it was in the economy of their wisdom that they made a decision. Our hearts were tormented, our minds were deluded, our faith was as flat as a punctured tire, but the cross awakens hope and offers forgiveness, which is, if embraced, creates confidence in Jesus to do what he has promised. In July 1, 1902, Ellen penned these words, few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator, And here's the statement. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. Every departure from right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. And so I think there's a reference in the Bible that says something like uh, he was crucified, or that's not the right word. Some of you will probably know it. He suffered from the foundation of the world. It wasn't in, just in 31 AD that this happened, but he's felt the pain, being reminded, it, reminded of it for every deviation from his plan for us. Well, as sinful as we are, we still cringe when we witness animal or child abuse. So how do you feel, how do you think God feels when there's spousal abuse? child abuse, uh, student abuse, any kind of abuse, any kind of cruelty. Well, we're given an insight from uh, Judges 10.16. When there came upon Israel the calamities that were a sure result of separation from God, subjugation by their enemies, cruelty, and death, it is said that his soul was grieved. He didn't take pleasure in the disciplinary action that came about. His soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Abraham Heschel captured the compassion of our creator when he wrote, the most exalted idea applied to God is not infinite wisdom or infinite power, but infinite concern, or I would choose the word compassion. How grateful we can be that he is infinitely compassionate toward us. He doesn't disdain us. He doesn't throw us under the bus when we've fallen. He's drawing us to himself. And he doesn't draw us by scolding us. He doesn't draw us by shaming us. He has his own ways of connecting with us. And praise God, he's not limited to what we think about. Well, going on to the, the gospel prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and Hosea, In those books, we find God's yearning and compassion for his people addressed, addresses, he addresses directly. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Is it beginning to dawn upon us how pivotal the cross of Christ is, not only to our salvation, but dealing with our own pain and suffering? The magnitude of our personal earthquake may be devastating. The aftershocks may be frequent and unnerving. But if the cross is a centerpiece where we've seen him experience more pain and suffering than we could ever imagine ourselves, and know that we are the object of his compassion. He has the capacity to identify with the pain that we experience. 
So if the cross is the filter through which we understand God's love and through which we view his compassion over our greatest loss, our deepest grief will be transformed. And we will be just as amazed as Mary was over that process. The cross of Christ is what gives us perspective, meaning, and hope to our pain and suffering. It may be a childhood deprivation resulting in lifelong emotional turmoil or a congenital disability of mind or body, or suddenly and without warning we are overtaken by a painful illness or bereavement, or perhaps we're afflicted by unexpected losses, loss of employment, involuntary singleness, broken love affair, an unhappy marriage, divorce, depression, or loneliness. Suffering comes in so many forms. And sometimes we not only ask God our agonizing questions, why and why me, but even like Job, we rage against him, accusing him of injustice and indifference like Mary Craig. But those comments didn't, what shall I say, what shall I say didn't interfere with what God wanted to do for Mary, nor will it when we experience these kinds of things. All have felt abandoned at some point, but none of them were. And the cross is God's pledge of his solidarity with us in our loss. I found the clear word uh, rendering of our scripture text to be refreshing. Um, Craig Paul often uses this and brings it to us in, in um, our prayer meeting. But this passage says in the clear word, he gave us a wonderful high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who came to live with us and who has now gone through the heavens into the very presence of God, ministering there on our behalf. So let's hold firmly to the faith we profess. We don't have a high priest who doesn't understand us or who's incapable of feeling our pain. He was tempted more powerfully than any of us will ever be tempted, yet he never sinned or lost hold on God. So let's approach our Father's throne with confidence, asking him for mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. True, there are many kinds of suffering Jesus did not endure. He wasn't a woman. And so all the things that women experience, you would think he can't identify with. I've alluded to um, Joni Erickson Tata's experience, but not this particular story, and I wanted to share that with you. As you remember, she was a 17-year-old, athletic, attractive young girl who had a diving accident, uh, or a swimming accident, diving accident, whatever you want to call it, in Chesapeake Bay, which left her quadriplegic. She told her story with transparent honesty including times of bitterness, anger, rebellion, and despair, and how gradually, through the love of her family and friends, she came to trust God and to build a new life under the rich blessing of God. One night, about three years after the accident, Cindy, who was one of her best friends, uh, was there to encourage her, and uh, I think she must have been inspired to make this point. She said to Joni, or Johnny, I guess she goes by, referring to Jesus, he was paralyzed too. It had never occurred to her before that on the cross, Jesus was in a similar pain to hers, unable to move, virtually paralyzed. And she found this thought deeply comforting. So as we go through whatever we're called to go through, as we cry out with our questions, our anger, even if it becomes toxic, we need to realize and remember that it doesn't turn God off. He doesn't throw us under the bus because we have questions, or even if we pray toxically with anger, he died for us while we were in that condition. So do you think he's going to abandon us when we go through those experiences? Of course not. 
And so the cross of Christ transforms suffering into a redemptive experience. We may go through all the emotional uh, turmoil, but we should be encouraged that even though Jesus was not a drug addict, he wasn't a woman, he didn't go through a long, painful process of dying where he loses his abilities over a period of time. He didn't go through that, so how can he identify with that? Well, when we go through temptation, do you think it hits its zenith before we, that we overcome it at its zenith? Probably not. We probably give in before the temptation has reached its potency. And so Jesus, what was his uh, experience? Did Satan uh, cool the embers so it wouldn't be as intense for him? No. He was banking on that he could get Jesus to, to fall away. And he put pressure as no other man or woman or a young person has experienced on Jesus. But Jesus continued to overlook how he felt, to cling to his father because he was his father and he loved him with great and deep love. And so we need to follow G uh, Paul's um, counsel, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him, set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, 16 to 18 another encouraging uh, passage from Paul. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. I found a statement from a well-known preacher, uh, T.D. Jakes. I don't listen to him. I don't listen to too many preachers, I guess, very much. But the, what he said captured my attention. And it seemed like a, a great headline, which said, your purpose is greater than your pain. Let that sink in for a while. But I think we need to fine tune it a little bit. I would choose to rephrase it. God's purpose for you is greater than your pain. It's not as if our purpose is greater than our pain because we've just developed a whole new purpose and it's strong and it's going to rest on my effort. We don't want to allow for that kind of thinking. It's God's purpose for you and me is greater than our pain. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can call you by that endearing phrase that Jesus used empty of all of the abuse that fathers can sometimes heap on children, that you're the one who tenderly looks after us. We do live in a world in, the, in which the enemy tries to sabotage your character and how you operate. We pray that you'll help us to keep the cross, <clears throat> the centerpiece in our journey so that we can rise above the enemy's attempts to sabotage our faith. We pray that regardless of how difficult the earthquake that we may be experiencing is, that we may realize that you are there for us, that you will reveal yourself to us even if we have slipped into toxic talk and prayer. We're grateful that you do not abandon us. It's not you that have walked away. And we just pray that a an awareness of the cross will keep us focused. It'll counterbalance the fallen nature that seeks to express itself so frequently through us. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the assurance of your love and your self-sacrificing gift of Christ. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.